Well, welcome again, everybody. And um, it's really good to have, uh, again, those of you who are here live to feel your presence really makes all the difference. It's an amazing thing, this virtual we space. And thank you, Corey. And thank you, Integral Life. Um, so I need to um, actually uh, get my notes up. There we go. And um, Tic Tacs, you can't live with them and you can't live without them. Um, so yesterday we talked about this expanding circle of things that are worthy of moral consideration. And, you know, typically in ethics, we talk about that in terms of other people and groups of people and other races and cultures and so forth. Uh, but yesterday we talked about Mother Nature having standing in the courts and uh, specifically a uh, suit that was filed Monday in the, uh, against the feds in um, Denver court uh, where the plaintiff was the Colorado River and uh, it's been exploited uh, and its rights have been violated by the state of Colorado. So uh, interesting topic. And, you know, uh, as I said, I, I don't, you know, know which, where it should go. I'm actually sort of trying to relax into the fight and um, be helpful when I can and make binary choices when I have to. Uh, and, and I'll otherwise trust the system. And there's a certain feeling of expansion that comes from that. Um, and, and so I wanted to sort of stick with that theme and mention something that um, had a really big impact on me. I was surprised in a way. Uh, it's, it's a magazine that is on the, uh, the checkout of basically every um, supermarket in America. And we were visiting back in rural Pennsylvania, actually up in the Allegheny Mountains last week and saw it there. And it's a book that is, it's a magazine, it's you know, 15 bucks or so, um, from National Geographic called Inside Animal Minds what they think, feel, and know. And, you know, it's a magazine kind of thing. And um, I read it on the plane, and I was a different person when I finished reading it. I was. I was expanded. I, the world was more alive and more complex, and I was more connected to it than I was in the hour and a half before I read it. And so I want to share some of that with you because, you know, part of what we do at the Daily Evolver is we want to notice where integral consciousness is arising. And I think this magazine is an, an example of that. Um, so they start with, um, you know, in the, in the very first page, uh, an homage to Darwin. And they talk about Darwin's investigation of Earthworm Intelligence. In fact, the very last book he wrote was titled The Formation of Ve Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms. So that's that. So this is from that. Darwin's investigations of possible earthworm intelligence ran for more than 30 pages. Meticulously, he described how they chose and arranged leaf fragments to seal their burrows. Evidence, he thought, of something more than raw instinct at work. One alternative alone is left, he wrote, namely that worms, although standing low in the scale of organization, possess some degree of intelligence. This will strike everyone as very improbable, but it may be doubted whether we know enough about the nervous system of the lower animals to justify our natural distrust at such a conclusion. And, um, and then the final paragraph here, as simple as earthworms might seem, he granted them awareness and intelligence. Sealing a burrow was no small feat. More than that, he implicitly acknowledged their possession of an interior life. And that is a big bingo for me. Uh, uh, and, 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 and what that means is that, you know, using aqual theory, uh, and thank you, Ken, 
uh, it means that they have interior quadrants. They have the left-hand quadrants. That there is a sense of identity that is, um, you know, less complex than ours, but of the same stuff. And that, uh, you know, is really very powerful to me. The other thing that um, is when Darwin, Darwin's talking about the, 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 the lower nervous system and the, and the lower structures. And of course, you know, there's lower structures of the brain. Uh, and that's more abstract to me with, you know, the reptilian brain and all of that stuff. But what's alive for me there is the feeling of just my gut, my lower chakras, you know, my, you know, my base. Uh, what intelligence is there that, you know, I, I, I sort of uh, take into account uh, in my higher stages where I'm beginning to think and think in terms of time and use abstractions, but that that base intelligence is there and I want to see it for what it is. And that's one of the things I appreciate about this book is that I, even though they don't say it uh, in so many words, uh, there is a transmission of not only do animals have higher intelligence than we thought, but we also have animal intelligence and that, and that's worth looking at. So um, just a couple things here. Um, we all know about the um, self-awareness tests where some animals can recognize themselves in mirrors. And this has been sort of a gold standard test where they'll mark an X on the forehead of an elephant, put him in front of a big mirror, and he starts investigating the X with his trunk. So he sees that that um, reflection is himself, and that's a, a, a test for self-awareness. And there's a number of um, animals that have that capacity, apes, gorillas, orangutans, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, but also, um, uh, in addition to elephants, dolphins magpies, manta rays, and possibly pigs. And, and now, they're, they, it writes here, some scientists now argue that self-awareness, and I love this, self-awareness is a bedrock capacity that all vertebrates and even insects possess. All that's needed is some mental representation of an individual's place in space. Distinguishing between oneself and everything else is a basic solution to the challenges of navigating life. And I love how that opens up this sense of self-awareness to just the knowledge of myself in space and the, all, uh, the knowledge of myself versus other. You know, and what doesn't have that? You know, yesterday I was talking about this amazing video on YouTube where a, uh, a white blood cell is chasing a bacteria around, uh, you know, and they're hiding from each other. And they're, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's, but at any rate, so, um, so there's that. Then there's lots in here. I'm just going to hit a couple highlights, actually. Uh, problem solving. Um, and, and so problem solving, we know that animals solve problems. We know that rats can go through maze. We know that some dogs are pretty good at picking a lock on a gate. Uh, but the question is, are they thinking about it? Um, or are they uh, just doing trial and error? And, you know, and, and, where, and what is instinct? Instinct sort of puts them in the it category. You know, there's nothing really going on except automatic behaviors. And so that's been a... Um, an argument. And so, you know, they talk about all these kind of cool ways that animals use tools and they talk about monkeys washing sweet potatoes, chickadees opening milk bottles. Um, and they, they note that there are no fewer than 2,500 avian in, innovations and 500 primate, primate innovation observed in the wild. Uh, but again, is it thinking or is it insight? Is it, is it thinking and insight, or is it trial and error? And so here's how he explains it. There, there's often an unspoken assumption that insight is special because it's what we humans do. 
Crows are said to display human-like intuition. Trial and error, observation, and persistence are, by implication, considered lesser forms of problem solving. Yet, as we know from our own experience, solutions don't always come in a spontane spontaneous flash of insight. Sometimes we just keep trying until something works. The distinction between human-like and animal-like reasoning is a bit misleading. We all do both. And again, you know, I feel the updraft of that realization, you know, that not only do they do what we do, but we're doing what they're doing. And it's just a matter of complexity more than a matter of stuff. And when I read this piece, I was like, who is writing this? I know it's National Geographic and everything, but who's the person who's writing this? And so it's Brandon Keim, uh, K-E-I-M. And I looked him up. And first of all, may I say that he's very cute. Uh, <laughs> but also a very cool guy. Uh, he does a lot for National Geographic. He's a beautiful writer. Uh, but a beautiful thinker, an integral thinker in my mind, whether or not he's heard of integral, he has that feel of being able to move perspectives and just a, a bigger flex flow mind, if you will. And uh, I thought an interesting uh, 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 tidbit, I went to his website, it's not long, uh, but uh, he is in invested in a cat food company where the food is made of insects. So, you know, he's working on real life things too. And I like that, that I'd never heard of such a thing, but you know, moral development, you know, we, we, we do have to discern since we are in this web of life that pushing the you know, food source down the, uh, the food chain is better than having it high. You know, there's just less, uh, there's less intelligence, I think we could say that. Uh, uh, it, it, it's not something other than intelligence all the way down, but there's less of it and ability to feel pain and ability for all of the stuff of suffering. So, you know, to push that down to the insect kingdom. And of course, you know, I was reading recently about the, uh, you know, Bill Gates and all of these cool people investing in food uh, production made out of insects. And that, you know, it's very, Prof uh, it, the mealworm flower business is very profitable. So I have some investment advice for you people. Mealworm um, flower industry. So interesting that I love the raccoons. They say that they're curious, smart, and, uh, but generally too unruly for studying in controlled settings. So we don't really know as much as we should about them. All right, so then um, we, uh, and this is where, you know, the, it, it continues. And again, I'm just want to hit some high points, but one of them was for me, reptiles, because I always thought reptiles, I, I had an easy relationship with I, it relationships with uh, reptiles. I didn't really, my friend, my friend had a big terrarium. I didn't want to touch them. I didn't really like seeing them. And they didn't feel like they had much more going on than <laughs> instinct you know, which was sort of basically a materialistic way of explaining away the interior. And so, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. So it was interesting to me that reptiles and fish have friends. They recognize each other if they've been, been separated. They, some like playing with others more than, other, than others. And they do indeed play. And they, they talked about Komodo dragons playing tug of war and knocking around buckets. And if you speed up the video of a Komodo dragon playing, it's very similar to a dog playing. And I thought that was really cool. And then they talk about how um, animals dream. And we know that anybody who has a dog, it's, I hear cats too, but a dog for sure, um, you know, kicks his leg and, and you know, after, um, after one of my dogs, after if we have a real romp through the real wilderness, you know, we go up high, um, they come back and they have restless dreams. 
you know, where they're running and, and they're processing this, this thing that is so deeply important to them, so, so new and so primal for them, you know. Uh, but they talked about, there's one of the sort of a heartbreaking example of Michael, who was an orphaned Western lowland gorilla who learned human sign language. Uh, and so he had nightmares that he would sign in his sleep about seeing his parents killed by poachers. And that's sad. Um, they talk about art and aesthetics. Um, and, and this one's interesting to me, uh, you know, because I think of my dogs and, you know, we go to magnificent places and hikes and they don't appear to care about the view. Uh, but what they do care about is each other, for sure. They care about the other animals, uh, but they really care about each other. So if we uh, run across other dogs in the trail, um, you know, there's a lot of sniffing going on. Sometimes the sniffing leads to, okay, move on. Sometimes it leads to play. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, I always think of the New Yorker cartoon where it shows a, somebody in a waiting room and there's a, uh, there's, and, and it's a dog. And, and then there's a dog behind the desk with a little badge and he's, you know, the security dog. And the security dog is saying to the dog who wants to be let in, I'm sure you who, you're who you say you are, but regulations require that I sniff your butt. I always thought that was a good one. And so they love to do that. So I think there's an aesthetic something there, clearly. Uh, but um, on 57, let me see if I can find it here real quick. They talk about, um, yes, aesthetics. And, um, Oh, and I love this. And, and I love this Brandon guy. He's a beautiful, again, I think the integral thinker. He says, a humpback whale's song or the dance of a sandhill crane would be, if performed by a human, celebrated for its artistry. I'll say that again. A humpback whale song or the dance of a sandhill crane would be, if performed by a human, celebrated for its artistry. Uh, performed by animals, these feats tend to be categorized as merely instinctive. Yet a guitar virtuoso plays instinctively, but is also conscious of the larger composition. It's not hard to imagine that a female peacock enjoys the sight of a male's kaleidoscopic plumage. You know, why not, why else? And, you know, Ken points out that, you know, in addition to survival of the fittest, the other sort of key engine of evolution is female choice in terms of mating. And so, you know, these guys, these peacocks create this outrageous plumage that can't be um, functional otherwise evolutionarily. It gets in the way big time from the moving around. But those female um, uh, peacocks must be, you know, have a highly developed aesthetic sense. I mean, really, I'm serious. You know, so, um, okay. What of a white spotted puffer fish? So a white spotted puff puffer fish sculpting seafloor mandalas to woo a mate. The urge is instinctive but perhaps he's also attentive to its proportions, just as the target of his affections might find certain geometries especially pleasing. Isn't that great? I love that. So, um, oh, just, um, let's see here. Yeah. Skip that one. It's empathy and rats. I mean, you don't you don't want you don't want to know. Okay. All right. Grief. Um, after an infant's death, mother baboons seek comfort from kin, and display hormone profiles that accompany grief in humans. So I, I thought that was particularly interesting. We're talking in the body in, in the right hand quadrant, so upper right. Um, the hormone profile is the same with um, baboons that it is with human women who have lost their offspring. And that's, I think, very significant. 
There are many accounts of monkey grief. One of the best documented came from researchers who followed a tribe of golden snub-nosed monkeys who comforted, comforted and caressed a mortally injured female. After she died, one male remained by her side and embraced her. So again, the same stuff of us, uh, although, you know, less complex, presumably. I mean, I'm not even sure about that anymore. And then finally, the last one, uh, ritual and spirituality. Um, among the chimpanzee behaviorals, be, among the chimpanzee behaviors documented by primatologist Jane Goodall, perhaps the most extraordinary involves males who carefully approach a local waterfall, moving rhythmically and throwing rocks into the churning waters before sitting in contemplation. And uh, just incidentally, don't we love Jane Goodall? Um, she was on 60 Minutes the other night and um, you know, they were talking about how she changed. I mean, the idea of anthropomorphizing, of, of, of describing human characteristics to animals was, I was taught that it was, it was you know, the, 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 the thing that we should not do uh, when I was in school. I believed it for many years. And that was the scientific consensus when she came online doing this research. And, um, you know, it took a while for her to be taken seriously. And, uh, and I loved that, I think it was Steve Croft, the, the older guy with kind of a square face was interviewing her and they clearly had a nice rapport. He, she's, you know, late eighties or something. She's still traveling around, she's amazing. Uh, and they showed pictures of her back in her day when she was in her late twenties uh, in the jungle with these chimpanzees. And he said to her, uh, in terms of her getting attention and so forth, he says, it didn't hurt that you were a babe, did it? <laughs> Which I thought was kind of cheeky for you know television where we're not supposed to do that sort of thing. And she was great. She smiled and said, no, it didn't hurt a bit. <laughs> so it made me love her all the more. So anyway, you know, I just wanted to say that I was enlarged. I mean, literally, I mean, I feel the world is just, I feel like I'm part of it, I'm knitted into it. And these it's that I see running around are actually thou's that I can relate to that have the same stuff that I do and actually love their lives like I love mine and are happy and sad and um, hurt and pained and have grief and connection and community and friendships and um, you know, that's so, you know, it's really new. And, and, and it's easy for me to sort of snap back to the I, it thing. I mean, that's sort of my default, even to this day, you know. Uh, but I've been working with my one dog, Stella, <laughs> my sort of problem dog. I love her to death, but she's a little bit of a problem. She's highly strung and she just, you know, like the, the, the specific problem is, feeding her. She doesn't want to eat when the other dog want to eat, wants to eat. And I often have other dogs that stay here. I have cousin dogs and stuff. And they are all good. They just eat what I feed them and I feed them regularly. But she doesn't want to do that. And so, uh, you know, I can't make her eat. Uh, and then, you know, an hour or two later, she'll come and lick or paw me and, and, and look at me balefully and start licking her lips uh, because she's hungry. And so I can feed her and sometimes I do, but I kind of resent it because she's a dog. She should eat when I feed her. And, and, and worse, when I leave her with my friend, Michelle, who dog sits or Michelle runs a tight ship, she said she eats when I feed her. And if she doesn't eat, I pick it up and I don't feed her till the next time. And she soon learns to eat when I feed her. And <laughs> I tried to do that. I would have been a terrible father. Uh, but I couldn't. I just, I didn't want her to be hungry. And, and, and so it's just sort of been this struggle within me with, between her and me. And, and it, after reading this, and this is just 10 days ago, uh, it just occurred to me, why can't she just be Stella? 
you know, what's so important about my life and my status that I can't accommodate her, even if it's a little less convenient for me? You know, as I said, I've never had kids. I don't have grandkids. I, I, you know, nurturing another being, you know, to do a little bit for my little black dog um, just seems to be worth it. And, and so for the last uh, 10 days, uh, whenever she, I still I feed the other dogs, and then when she comes and noses me and looks at me and licks her lips, I feed her. And, um, and it feels like a little moment for us. It feels like a little communication and, um, and I love it. And I feel like that's, you know, a practice that I could do, you know, integral practice because integral wants us to continue to enlarge and bring things in, you know, unfurl our sails, you know, uh, activate our sensors to, in this case, the interiority of animals, the left-hand quadrant reality of their consciousness, their knowledge of themselves, their special gifts, their own sort of rules of perception, and also the relationship with their world and, and, and with each other. They're, you know, they're social creatures. Even they talk about these hideous little snakes that are like some of the most aggressive snakes uh, on the planet. And they live in little dens with each other. And um, so anyway, so that's uh, National Geographic, Geographic Inside Animal Minds by this really cool guy who deserves attention, Brandon Keim. So that's it for today, folks. Uh, so uh, we, we do have a couple questions, Jeff, if you have oh, cool. an extra time. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and before we get to that, you know, I, I was remind as you were talking about the, uh, the humpback whale songs, I was reminded of a Carl Sagan book that I, I'd read the book maybe 15 years ago and the book was already 20 years old by the time I read it. So forgive me if I'm not remembering all the details correctly, but he was talking about, you know, you're talking about sort of the aesthetic quality of, of these songs. And he was actually talking about it from more of a, an informational point of view, more of a third person informational view where, you know, he basically did some back of the napkin calculations and estimated hypothesized how many bits of information are actually contained in a single one of these humpback whale songs which you know as Sagan said you know these whales will repeat the same half an hour long song throughout their lives over and over and over again note for note beat for beat sometimes adding a little bit of variance here and a little different syncopation over there but it's largely you know you can think about it in terms of it having themes and it maintains those themes and it repeats those themes until it dies. So after doing his calculations, trying to figure out, you know, how much information is actually being conveyed here, he estimated that there's as much information in a half an hour long humpback whale song as there is in Homer's The Odyssey. Wow. And then, wow. And, and, and this is one of the pieces of Carl Sagan that I really liked was that, you know, he would do this sort of, you know, more hard nosed calculation, but then, you know, you can kind of picture him sparking up the joint and just sort of like doing his ruminations afterwards. Cause then he, you know, wrote a couple paragraphs about, you know, just sort of reflecting on, I can't remember uh, what population he was talking about, but talking about how certain native Americans mythologize the whales as being, you know, basically like the, the memory banks of the world. And so Sagan, you know, wrote this very sort of lyrical passage saying, you know, it's, it's very, tempting and it's very it's lovely to imagine these creatures as sort of keeping memory intact keeping oceanic memory yeah. well intact. isn't it wonderful that we can experience this uh both imaginatively poetically like that and then also you know bring hard science to it yeah. as best we can so that we can also discern what's happening from you know the sort of factual point of view uh and so they work with each other and uh i love that we as integralists can um you know uh, receive both that's right that's yeah right. and well, carl sagan was certainly a you know one of our uh, fathers of integral consciousness oh for sure you know, say what you will yeah for sure yeah for sure um 
So yeah, we've got some questions. We've got two questions, uh, cool. one sort of related and one sort of not, but that's okay too. Sure, you bet. This question is from Mary Linda. Hi, Mary Linda. And I'm just gonna read this one. She asked me to read this. So she says, an article in EcoWatch states that our core ecological problem isn't climate change. It's overshoot, which is a systemic issue and global warming is a symptom. Rapid growth of resources led to overpopulation, pollution, and loss of habitat, and hence biodiversity. We've overexpanded, upsetting, and overshooting Earth's capacity for humans. From my perspective, our consciousness has not expanded in greater capacity to address this issue. We are as much in trouble here, if not more, than anything now we face with Trump and politics. Would love to get yours and Corey's perspective here. Thank you and love you both. First off, we love uh -huh. you too, Linda. Yeah, I love you too, Mary Linda. Uh, do you want to uh, take a stab at that, Corey? Oh, yikes. Uh, yeah, I mean... Because I can. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I really see this as a very sort of dialectical uh, question. You know, is overpopulation a problem? I think that given our current technological and moral development, yeah, it is a problem. Uh, will it continue to be a problem? Well, you know, I, I remember seeing studies saying that you know, if all of human civilization lived in a, you know, an urban zone, sort of like New York City, it would require like the state of Delaware to, to, to pack everyone in there, which leaves, you know, the vast majority, 99.5% of the Earth's surface, you know, would, would remain untouched. Now, obviously, that's not a direction we're going to be moving in as humanity. But, you know, I do think the crux of our problem right now is, you know, sort of the old cliche that, you know, today we have godlike technology, medieval level governments, governance systems, and Neolithic emotions. And, <laughs> uh, you know, we're, and we're really, I think, running into uh, the limitations there. You know, you're talking about Jane Goodall earlier, Jeff. And, um, you know, I look at sort of the social experiment we've been engaged in for the last 10 years. And one of my takeaways is that, you know, us apes were not ready for social media. We, we weren't ready for it. We weren't ready for sort of uh, the regressive tendencies that would come along with it. And, uh, you know, we certainly weren't ready for the amount of division that it would end up creating and the amount of polarization that it would end up creating, um, which seems to be one of our target problems. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't separate this problem from the problem of Trump or the problem of politics, because obviously you know, politics itself is the art of the possible. And I remain very confident and hopeful that we actually have, a, you know, a, a lot more potential and a lot more possibilities than it seems like we currently have with this current administration. But, you know, evolution has a way of routing around uh, these challenges. Um, and we're seeing that with climate change. We're seeing that with Trump's withdrawal from, you know, from the Paris Accord and how, uh, how that's essentially been localized and decentralized. So, you know, the citizenry is taking it upon themselves to, uh, you know, to, to step up and to, to meet those standards themselves. Uh, again, routing around sort of the, you know, the administration. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I remain very hopeful about that. Um, largely optimistic, although I'm, you know, the older I get, the more increasingly sensitive I get to, um, you know, not overlooking people's pain and not overlooking the stickiness and the, the suffering um, and, you know, how it, it's, it's a bloody road, um, but we are on the road. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think the observation, Jeff, that we made 15 years ago, um, you know, looking at where the world was going is, is, is even more appropriate today, which is things are getting better and better, worse and worse, faster and faster. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Shall we go to the next question? Sure. Uh, and this one is way out of my pay grade. So, uh, Jeff, do you think there was an inner and an outer of things before the Big Bang? And this is related to the high, subtle, or low causal archetypes that Ken talks about in his New Religion of Tomorrow book. Um, I think the answer to that is no. Um, is that all manifest reality, including uh, no, 
non-material reality. And this is a, something that it's taken me a long time to get my head around, is that the left-hand quadrants are still in the world of form. They're what happened after the Big Bang. Uh, so you have, you know, consciousness and culture, and that sort of the liquid um, left-hand quadrant that holds us together. Uh, that's the, that's the, existed after the Big Bang. Now, what existed before the Big Bang is just simply a mystery. We can just conjecture that. But whatever it is, it is the, um, it was capable of, of, of uh, you know, creating, apparently out of nothing, uh, the manifest world, which includes all four quadrants. So that's a short answer. I hope that makes sense. Uh, but that took me a while to get my arms around. Because I always wanted to make the left-hand quadrants be emptiness. And, and then, you know, the right-hand right quadrants were form. Not so. Right. The, all four quadrants are form. And then there's emptiness. And emptiness is, um, you know, uh, people talk about it is, I, I realized the annihilation of everything when I realized emptiness. And some people talk about it, I realized the fullness of everything. And so, you know, this is where words, we have to go real poetic. And, and what a great problem, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely running into some semiotic limitations here where, yeah. you know, any attempt to sort of wrap words around the ineffable only makes it effable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And once it's we, effable, you're fucked. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's like we can't talk about it, but we can't stop talking about it. That's right. That's right. Well, uh, if anyone else has a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand right now. Um, otherwise, I'm going to take a moment to actually plug um, a really, really killer piece of content that we just launched today. Um, you can find it on integrallife.com. It's right there on the homepage. It's called Ralph Ellison's Integral America. And this is a conversation, the second in the series, actually, between uh, our really good friends, Greg Thomas and Dr. Mark Foreman. And uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful discussion. It's absolutely beautiful discussion and a, a, a much needed discussion for, uh, for our era and what we're struggling with right now. Um, the dialogue is available for free. Uh, you just have to enter in your email address and you can download it. It's about an hour long. Um, I'm not going to go so far as to say, you know, we've solved racism, but we're damn close. We're like, we're like, yeah. <laughs> finally. So any day now, guys. What's so, the name of it again, Corey, so if people can find it? Ralph Ellison's Integral America. Okay, great. Yep. Yeah, well, you know, I'm a big Greg Thomas fan and Mark Foreman. So I'm, I'm eager to, to hear that. Yep, for sure. And Corey, what fun. Yeah, this is, this is great, man. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm having so much fun, you know. I was just telling you the other day that... Um, you know, this is this is beneficial for me personally, uh, not only because I love you and I love working with you and and, and doing this, but, um, you know, it gets me uh, it, it gets me on the camera, which is sort of a big deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just I really enjoy playing, you know, Paul Schaefer to your letterman. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think I, I need a few more music. My cup runneth over. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just hope we, we keep this going. Um, this has been a great experiment and I hope everyone can join us tomorrow. For the uh, final show of the week, yep. we announced. Yeah, and then we'll I, I, actually. I know, and I might as well say it. I, I can't do next week because okay. I, have, I have other things planned. And as we put this together, we thought that this could be a good experiment week. But I'm loving it, and I uh, I'm thinking of some ways to do it in a way that would be. I, I'm still very much up in the air. But um, it's nice to see that the, the people continue to grow. That's because, you know, people are listening to it after as well. And then I'm going to turn these into podcasts that we'll, uh, uh, you know, promote or uh, that we'll post at the end of the week. Um, so um, anyway, uh, a great experiment. Thank you for being part of it. And we'll see where we are uh, at the end of the week. So be, be right back here tomorrow. Same time, same station. That's right. Thanks, All right. Thanks, Corey. Bye, Jeff. Bye-bye.